All right, we're live. Here we go, guys. Okay, welcome back to TWIP. I am your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Joining me today to discuss some of the cool things in the world of photography this week are Miss Sarah France. She's a 10-year San Diego, California-based wedding photography veteran. Also, Mr. Nate Blunty Burr. He's an online content creator, YouTube star, gamer, vlogger, and photographer, and probably a bunch of other things that I don't know about. Welcome both of you to this week in photo. Sarah, let's start with you. What have you been up to lately? I know you're doing a bunch of stuff. What's happening? Always a bunch of stuff. So um, we've been really busy because I launched a new um, business with myself and two other female photographers. So we have France photographers now down in San Diego. So there's three female photographers to choose from and it's been super awesome but and really exciting and then I have a creative live coming up so we are preparing for all of that plus we're in the middle of wedding season so you know I mean we're just hanging out not really brands photographers I had no idea you're expanding you're taking over the world now congratulations I know one of um, my photographers who started with me initially she already has more weddings booked than I do this year <laughs> And, of course, you take a little cream off the top of each one of those, right? Oh, it's fantastic, yes. The team <laughs> is awesome, and my girls are, are wicked hot. Awesome. Very cool. Well, yeah. welcome. And so where where is that at? If you want to go see those wicked hot girls, is it uh, francephotographers.com? Francephotographers yep, awesome. francephotographers.com. All right. Well, cool. Well, welcome back to the show. Thanks. Also on the show is Mr. Nate Blunty Burr. Hey, Nate, what's going on, man? Hello, Frederick. Hello, Sarah. It's good to be back on the show. Uh, guest, guest host this time, I guess, instead of interviewee. Yes, uh, yes. Fun. I'm looking forward to it. You are now officially a pundit. So, <laughs> <laughs> a twip pundit. You were a pundit before, but now you're a twip pundit. What's been going on in your world? You're always traveling around, playing around with new gear, all that stuff. What's happening? Always doing a lot of stuff. Uh, uh, I've just taken a, a small break on a little uh, cruise, a little two night cruise, which was very relaxing. But uh, as far as the photography stuff going, I'm looking at uh, building reviews at the moment for the Panasonic GH4, then you uh, camera shoot 4K video, which is really interesting. Interesting. I'm having a lot of fun playing with that. Um, I'm looking at uh, the new 25mm f1.8 lens from Olympus for the Micro Four Third cameras. That's a really nice bit of kit too. You get that sort of that nifty fifty kind of feel from it. Um, also, I just got the other day to play with the new Sigma 50mm f1.4 art lens, which is mm. their new biggest and brightest and fancy lens that you know is about a thousand dollars worth but it is apparently out competing four and a half thousand dollars worth of uh, uh, Zeiss glass out there so uh, I'm just starting to play with that and it's pretty incredible so far so I'm having a lot of fun with that so uh, that's cool so you you always get all the cool stuff what, how yeah. is that? <laughs> like, I last time when I interviewed you you had gotten your hands on the the new Olympus camera or was it it was probably EM1 at that point and now you've played you've been playing with the new was it the what's the new one it was the EM10 the EM10 yeah, yeah. so the between those two of the OMD line. between those two which is the winner for you if you are a pro shooter um, you probably want to go for the EM1 just because that has more physical controls on it. But mm. bang for buck, the EM10 is astounding. The It's got the best of both worlds when it comes to the stabilization and the sensor between the EM1 and EM5. It's got the sort of a combination between those two. Uh, the image quality is fantastic. The responsiveness is fantastic. The control layout, although more limited than the one, is really sort of natural feeling. I love the Olympus's menus. But yeah, it is easily the best bang for buck you can get in a stills camera at the moment. Uh, video, Olympus still lag behind a bit. The video out of it is really nice, but your control is limited. You only get 1080p at 30 frames per second, whereas on the Panasonics you get you know, a whole bunch of different frame rates and playroom and stuff. But uh, right. yeah, for, for me right now, it's it's my, my, uh, my daily driver camera. It's the one I pick up and head out the, the door with most often. Very cool, very cool. Well, I'll tell you guys, before we jump into the show, um, quickly what's going on with me. I just got back a couple days ago from New Zealand for the first mm -hmm. time, so Nate, I was in your neck of the woods down there. Sorry I didn't stop by for a beer, but... Went right next door, man. You could have just popped over, <laughs> said hello, had a beer. This <laughs> is one continent over. I mean, come on, what's wrong with me? But, uh, <laughs> man, that flight is something else, boy. Air, Air New Zealand is great. They did a great job, but... No matter how you cut it, 15 hours in the air, not a good scene for, for Frederick. 
not good. So anyway, I went out there. I hung out with Trey Radcliffe for his his New Zealand nature photography landscape workshop. Had a great mm-hmm. time out there. In typical Radcliffe style, at the end he we were. I got to tell you guys a story. This story is amazing. And so Trey, I was there with Trey and and Verena Patel, who's an Arcana master as well was there with uh, Peter Giordano and uh, Curtis Simmons. So we're all like, Trey said, oh, I have a big surprise for you guys before you jump on the plane. This is like literally about five hours, four hours before I had to jump back on the plane to come back to the States the last day. So we went out to this area where they had this amazing sort of statue installation of a bunch of animals. Anyway, so we went out there and I was like, oh, this is an amazing surprise. So we're all taking pictures of those. And then Trey, <laughs> Trey strategically positions me. He goes, hey, can you shoot some video of me kind of facing in this direction? Because, I, you know, I like the light or whatever. So I started shooting video of him with my, with my GH3. And this helicopter <laughs> comes <laughs> and lands, like, right there. You know, he's, he's, the helicopter pilot circled us and then landed. It's this awesome black, like, you know, Larry Ellison-style helicopter. So it landed... And we get in that thing and proceeded to bounce from mountaintop to mountaintop. Oh. We landed on a glacier. We landed at all these different places, shooting aerials, flying over lakes. It was insane. So that was my uh, my favorite tr- event from that uh, from that trip, aside from all the crazy photography we did. Um, so I did that. And then uh, Sarah, speaking of France, I'm heading yeah. to France in, uh, in a couple weeks. Yeah, I'm going to Paris oh. to hang out. Actually, so I'm, going, I'm not going to Paris. I'm going to Champagne. First, and then, uh, then in June, I'm going back to uh, to Paris. So I'm kind of touring your country over there. So, ooh, I like it. It'd be fun. <laughs> and then, lastly, a bunch of things are happening on Twip. So, Sarah, you're making significant changes to Sarah France Photography with France Photographers. Yes. Twip is evolving in a way that I will not explain right now. However. I was interviewed by Karen Hutton for her show, The Chat, which is going to air Wednesday as we record this. Just go over, we'll link to her YouTube channel, so you, by the time this episode goes live, her chat will be live, and I describe what This Week in Photo is going to evolve into over the coming weeks slash months. And I think, I think you all will be pleased with the direction we're taking. So... Anyway, uh, before we jump into the show, I want to give a quick nod to our first sponsor for this episode of TWIP, and that's our friends over at FreshBooks.com. Okay, guys, let's jump into the show. The first story is big. So I saw this when I was over in New Zealand come through, and I was like, Ugh, I want to talk about this. So huge changes at Google+. Plus. You guys, we linked to the, in the show notes, we linked over to the TechCrunch article, I believe, uh, where they kind of made an attempt at breaking this down, but just to preface this discussion, as far as I know, no one has any definitive data on what Google's reasoning was <laughs> behind this move, and what we're reporting on here, what we're, gonna, we're about to discuss is basically, and I wrote this in the notes, we're reporting on a report that Ars Technica is reporting on reportedly from a report that TechCrunch allegedly got their hands on. So, <laughs> so this is the inside information. Basically, Vic uh, Gondatra, he's the he was the head of Google Plus. Recently announced his departure, and then then there's a bunch of speculation. Like Google is expected to end the forced integration of Google Plus with all the other properties that it owns, like YouTube, etc., and allegedly going to rearrange and shuffle around 1,000 to 2,000 employees to different parts of Google. So. TechCrunch tech via Ars Technica is saying that Google Plus failed to gain, I'm holding up quote finger, fingers, failed to gain the traction that they expected, and it hasn't been able to topple Facebook as the social network of choice for consumers. So who knows what that means? So in, a, in that article, I read through it a couple times. In that article, they said things like, you know, whenever you mention Google Plus, people cringe and all this other stuff. I never cringe when people mention Google Plus because I don't no. live on Google. <laughs> so, Sarah, let's start with you. You read this. I know you had a look at this. You probably heard the news when it came out. Do you, what do you think about this? I mean, Google Plus as the third kind of social network, Twitter, Facebook, Google Plus, has it ever gained traction? And does you this know, mean it's over? 
It has have a, had a really hard time, I will say that for sure. But you're right, it has a specific type of a group. It's like a techie group or the photographer group that really loves and embraces it. And it's, and it's a really neat network. So I don't think that it's a place that they shouldn't continue to, you know, invest in. Um, but I do know why it would go away if, if they choose to get rid of it, just because it, it probably hasn't picked up as much as they've wanted to. And Google Plus has been around a while now. Yeah. I mean, how long, I don't know exactly how long it's been, but I know I joined years ago. So I would have loved to have seen more people actually get engaged with it. But I do think that at some point Facebook is going to fade a little bit and they're, everybody's going to look for the new cool thing. So I don't think Google should give up on Google+. Plus. I think it's um, definitely got some promise. And, and you never know when people might actually start to, I don't know, lose disinterest and have nowhere to go if there's no Google Plus. They will always. I mean, remember, remember what was it, Friendster and then MySpace? Right. I mean, there's there's exactly. always a new social network, and it's about that time. So I don't know, Nate. Don't what, know. what do you think, Nate? Do you think you think it's time for Google to pivot, or should they just press on and you know, damn, damn the icebergs? Well, first off, this is everything that's wrong with tech reporting right now. Something mm -hmm. that's a sliver of information and then tries to extrapolate on extrapolations of extrapolations and yes. then guess work. Yep. And it just drives me insane because all it does, it's just designed to drive hits to the page because it says yep. something dramatic like Google Plus is shutting down and everyone who cares about Google Plus is going to rush there and panic and leave comments about how much they love Google Plus and how it's essential and everyone who hates Google Plus is going to rush there and go, oh, thank goodness I hated the forced integration in YouTube comments. And Yeah, well. But Google have never been shy about uh, shutting down services that were pop I mean, when they shut down Reader, uh, that was a real kick in the teeth because I love that service. I used it all the time, daily, yep, three times, four times a day. Um, yep. But they shut it down because it just wasn't doing what they wanted to do or it wasn't bringing in the kind of information they wanted to bring in. I don't know. Same thing with Google. But if Google Plus goes away, there's going to be a lot of angry photographers out there because the photography community in particular has really responded to it. And I've met dozens of, of fantastic uh, people and photographers through Google Plus over the last few years in, in my local area and internationally and I've been on photo walks and things and, and pub crawls and, and all that kind of stuff through Google Plus that I wouldn't have been exposed to otherwise because I refuse to use Facebook because I think it's run by sociopaths and I don't trust them and they've had you know privacy issue after privacy issue after privacy issue and they just it's sociopathic the way it's run but is Google Plus going to go away? No. I think Google Plus is going to change. I think it's the way things are going right now in this kind of social media tech world is things are starting to be broken down into separate apps. Google have just done it with their um, online document editing where it was all in Google Drive. Now that they're breaking it apart into different apps. Yeah. Facebook are doing it with their stuff. They've broken out Messenger into a separate different app. And I think that's kind of what's going to s sort of trickle down uh, through this Google Plus change, everything's going to be broken up into little separate chunks. So there'll be, you know, the 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 core of it, which will probably be moving to, you know, it will become something more like Flickr, very photography centric, and then there will be, you know, the the ubiquitous sign in that people can use everywhere, uh, which yeah. is what one of the main purposes of Google Plus. So like like know, breaking up to like make sort of stuff easy. Like breaking up AT and T, or kind of like what Sony did by breaking out their different divisions into different areas. Yeah. Kind of, you know, it's this the 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 Google Plus as it is today may not exist, but there'll be hopefully stronger vertical properties that continue on. Mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Google Plus. I use it all the time, you know, and I I I like the UI better than you know. I agree with you, Nate. Than than what Facebook is doing. I get overwhelmed on Facebook with what they're doing, and you know, people tend. To, I, I don't know about your friends, you guys' friends on Facebook, but. The people that I know on Facebook tend to overshare on Facebook. <laughs> not so much. Not, people use Facebook as therapy, you know. So not mm. not so much on Google Plus. It seems to be more of a, like you said, Nate, like more of a creative outlet for a photographer. Much more, much more focused with with what yeah. people share. You know, they they like you said on Facebook, people share. You know, the, every random stupid little vapid thought they have. But on Google Plus, you tend to get more focused stuff. You know, people share one photograph at a time instead of an album of stuff they had at the last night's drunken party, you know. It's right. Right. Much more much more better. That's good grammar. It's more much, awesome. 
<laughs> much more awesomer, much more likable. <laughs> Sarah, I mean, what what about people like I mentioned Trey Ratcliffe at the beginning? I checked his profile recently. He's got over seven million people following him oh on Google gosh. Plus, and Google wow. recently tweaked their algorithm or their page display to show views. You know, so you get the number of people following you, and then next to it, it shows how many views your page has gotten. His yeah. is in like I don't even billions and billions like you know Carl Sagan billions and billions of <laughs> views on his page, like what about uh, that? I mean, if Google starts breaking up into pieces like that, what about people that have built these mansions and continents on their platform? Is it just hey, sorry, but you know we're doing something else now. Go build something else. What, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, life has to move move on and technology moves on just like everything else so it would be unfortunate obviously and and not great for him at, in any way shape or form but um, definitely the thing about Google that I've always loved is that they're an amazing forward-thinking company mm -hmm. and just because yeah. they want to redirect their their interest into other areas please by all means could you finish building a car that drives itself because I really would prefer you, <laughs> you invest your time and energy on on that anyway so yeah. uh, I, I think that they'll make the right move and I have complete faith in the company that they'll they'll move in the right direction for them and hopefully for the future of, of technology for us yeah yeah let's let's hope because yeah like you said they are working on a ton of stuff I don't think this Google is a giant giant megalithic company monolithic megalithic I don't know I think I'm inventing words like me so <laughs> it's a huge company right so Google Plus you know it, it'll be interesting to see if they decide to disintermediate Google Plus from all the other services how they are they're able to do that and pull it out because it's almost you know not to use the cancer analogy but it is kind of like it is spread throughout Google and to extract it from there it seems like it would be kind of difficult. Uh, you know, I don't know, Nate. You think it's you think it's possible? It's technological glitter. Once you start putting glitter on something, it gets everywhere, yeah. and it, you just <laughs> cannot get rid of it completely, no matter how hard you try and vacuum and brush off your clothes. It's, but yeah, the, specifically from from my point of view, being the you know the YouTube guy, a lot of people hated the Google Plus integration into the YouTube comment system. On the surface of it, it made the comments a lot better because they're properly threaded now. They're all, you know, it's easy to read. But not everyone went, not everyone upgraded their account. So now the comment section, some people you can reply to, some you can't actually directly reply to because they never upgraded their account properly. A lot of people refused the connection altogether and now don't comment at all. And over the last uh, uh, sort of nine months or so, the number of comments left on each video of mine has kind of plummeted. Because of yeah. this, people have been, you know, they, they just don't comment anymore because they don't want that that tie in Google Plus stuff. It's made stuff more complicated for them. Despite the comment, you know, if everyone had jumped on board, the comment sections would have been better uh, served anyway. It's just uh, I don't think Google sold the message clearly enough, and and you know, people don't like being forced into this kind of stuff. So it became kind of a uh, uh, fuster cluck, if, if you'll excuse the. <laughs> Oh, I need a T-shirt that says that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know how they're going to undo what they've done to the Google uh, Plus YouTube comment sections because to roll backwards from that, I, I don't even know whether it's technically possible now that they've they've salted the ground with it. So I've got no idea what's going to happen there, but it, I bet you it's going to piss people off. <laughs> But how do you feel? I mean, you're you like I said in the beginning. You're I mean, you are a YouTube guy. You've been it w with it for years and years, and you rely on it. What? How does it? How does it? When you see this kind of news roll across your desk, someone who's making a living, you know, and using YouTube as part of your revenue, you know, not so much the ads presumably, but just the the delivery mechanism. When the giant corporation starts shaking the tree and saying, you know what, uh, let's do this instead of that. What do you do? Like, how does it affect you? Uh, well, there's not a lot individuals like me can do. We just sort of have to wait and see what happens and, and roll with the punches as best we can or ride the wave if it's a good thing, you know? Uh, but, yeah, YouTube, uh, well, Google through YouTube has made a ton of changes that, you know, the majority of users have shouted out about and said, no, we don't want this, but, they've, you know, they've done it anyway because it serves their corporate interests better for, you know, the music video stuff they do or the, you know, the, the big company stuff that's tied in. The individual users 
even as a as a group, you know, we we outnumber the big guys, but our voices aren't as uh, important to what Google do to the site. So it's um, yeah. yeah, you're kind of a bit helpless. You just have to sort of bob along on the top of the waves and uh, hope it doesn't completely nuke what you've tried to build and how you've gone about building it. Yeah, no, I agree. You get, you know, I'm in that boat as well because. TWIP itself, right? I mean, we're recording this show using Google Plus Hangouts, so we use Google for that. We are all sharing the same Google document, <laughs> you know, yep, yep. for the show notes, so we're doing that way. We Ultimately, the show file, I mean, we use Dropbox to share the file back and forth with all the producers and, you know, folks that create the backend stuff, um, but we were actually considered, considering moving that over to Google Drive, but when I see news like this, it makes me consider, like, okay, if everything goes to crap, what am I going to use? Should I use Skype? And should I use Dropbox? Go back to Dropbox? You know, all these different things go through my mind. And when they go through my mind, I'm thinking, as someone who runs a business on online, this is, it's kind of like, and I've said this online before, it's, it's almost like digital sharecropping. Because... You're, you're farming someone else's land. You're building a house in someone else's land. At any point, they can say, you know what? Uh, I, don't, I don't want those kind of crops growing on my land. Build, plant something yeah. else. Or I'm going to build a house, so you got to go. You know? So, Sarah, I mean, how do you, I mean do, you, do you agree with that? Because that, that's the, you know, I know Google's not going away, but I still always have that underlying uncertainty of I'm building on sharecropped land or on quicksand or something. I don't know. Yeah, I th I think unfortunately with technology and we've all gotten really used to the way how quickly things move and change. So, I mean, companies feel that way about us sometimes oh. too. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. It's yeah. like we're building something and you might just decide to pick up your house and go move it somewhere else and what are we going to do then? So, I I do agree, but I think that no matter what, there'll always be another service to pick up the slack and there'll yeah. always be um something that we're building and evolving on. So I don't ever worry that, oh my gosh, I'm going to put all of this into one thing and I'm not going to be able to move it or um, to be able to put it somewhere else. I think you really have to figure out which services you want to lean on and continue to invest in those. And as soon as they don't do what you do anymore, just be ready to move. I think that's the thing that people get too stuck when it, technology is moving so quickly. You have to be ready to make a change at the drop of a hat. Because yeah. that's just it. It's just life nowadays. Absolutely, yeah. Nate, someone uh, last week at the workshop, someone was I was having a conversation with someone about um, Panasonic, Olympus, and Sony. Because every you know there was a mixture of people. Everyone had all three of those. You know the the manufacturers were represented, and but there was this underlying concern about Sony's financial woes, Panasonic's financial woes and of course Olympus's <laughs> financial woes mm -hmm. like you know because I was shooting I think I was shooting this GH3 the Panasonic GH3 while I was there and people were like are you worried that Panasonic is going to go away or blah, blah blah and I said no because if that does happen like Sarah said if that does happen I'll get something else and mm -hmm. if Panasonic should go away tomorrow and stop selling cameras I still have my camera. <laughs> still, it's still going to work for quite a while. Unlike online, if Google goes away tomorrow, you know things are going to shut down. You, you feel the same way, Nate? About you know if if you're you you like Olympus cameras. If Olympus mm -hmm. goes away tomorrow, are you going to continue to shoot Olympus and then move to something else, or will you just say, you know what, I'm done. I'm going to Sony. Well, you know that's the thing. I mean, if you know Olympus does fall down tomorrow. Then you know I'm on board with the Micro Four Third system. I've invested my money in Micro Four Third lenses. That's not a system that's tied to a brand. I can yeah. move to one of Panasonic's bodies and keep my whole investment in my lenses. And that's a you know I think we've talked about this before. Invest in glass. Your camera body comes second because the glass is going to last you much longer than any camera body ever will. And you know if Sony disappears tomorrow, that doesn't mean the Sony cameras I own suddenly stop working or get reduced functionality. It just means you know, when it's time to upgrade, I'll look somewhere else. Um, but yeah, you, you always got to think about the the escape plan, particularly if you're investing in a, a system camera where you are making investments in not only the camera body, but lenses and accessories that all tie into, you know, this one bit of hardware or one series of hardware for one brand. So, but it's, it's, 
I mean, Panasonic have just posted their first profit in, I think, three years or something like that, so they're sort of starting to kick back up again. Um, I know Olympus, I don't know what their profit situation is like on their camera side yet, but on the medical side, I know they're doing brilliantly because the, the microscopes and endoscopes and all that sort of stuff they make, you know, they, they're all safe as houses there. Um, and as far as Sony's go, even if Sony cameras disappear, Sony still make the best sensors out there, so they'll still be selling sensors into other camera bodies. I mean... I've got three or four different branded cameras here. Each one of them has got a Sony Exmor sensor or something Same uh, like here. inside them right now. Uh, yeah. So it, it's not quite as simple as sort of shutting off the, the switch if one particular segment of their of someone's uh, 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 business sort of goes underwater. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, let's... Uh... Let's move on. This next story is really interesting. Sarah, I, I, I want to get both of you guys to chime in on it, but Sarah, you first, um, because you are in the business of making people look great, right? <laughs> so this, this, story, this story is about Imagenomic, um, a plugin which I purchased, um, the Portraiture plugin. It's an amazing plugin. So you plug this thing into Photoshop or Lightroom, and essentially it, it gives you, for me, it gives you like a kickstart or a you know, a head start on retouching if you're retouching like a portrait or something. And it, it doesn't make people look fake. It essentially leaves some imperfections in there but smooths people out so they just instantly look better. And then, you know, of course, depending on how you use it, you can render out a retouched version on a layer and then mask out. You know, so it's, it's actually really good. If you haven't checked out Portraiture, definitely go check out the videos they have on their site. It's amazing. But the news story is, when I got Portrait for the first time, I was like, this is amazing. I can't believe what it's doing. Wouldn't this be great if you could do this to video? And that's what they did. So they have a, a, a release candidate out, or a beta version, where you have to sign up to get your hands on it. And allegedly, I haven't seen this work, I've only read the page, but allegedly it will do the same thing that the plugin does for still photos to video, make people look better, smooth out skin, and all that cool stuff. Now, Sarah, I know you're primarily primarily a still shooter, but when you see this, what do you, I mean, is this like, okay, I need to start adding video to my repertoire. <laughs> what do you think? I, well, yeah. Um, we, we <laughs> In a word, yeah. <laughs> we shot a video today of, of us, so I just want to make sure my videographer has this so that he can make sure we look flawless. Right. Of course. Um, but yeah, I, I think that is a really amazing plugin. If it works the way um, that they that they say it does, uh, of course, that's something that everybody wants. And especially if it's natural, that's the that's the big thing when it comes to something like this. You want to look flawless and look like you didn't even try. It's like it's like women putting on their makeup. They're like, I want to look perfect, but of course, look like I'm not trying. So. Right. I think that that is really the key, and I'm really excited to actually play with it. I don't have it for um, Photoshop, but I would love to. I would love to give it a shot. We use some great tools from um, different services. Totally rad. We have an action from them, but I always love trying new things. Just you know, just like evolving with technology and seeing seeing what works best. But um, I think that new tool with video is going to be huge, especially in the wedding world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah. in the wedding world, if they could just figure out how to make girls skinnier too, if they could just add that as a photo, <laughs> as as an add-on, I mean, forget it. Yeah. <laughs> they just yeah. own the market. I am not touching that with a ten foot okay. pole. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> but Nate, I want to I want to put a different spin on it for you. So mm -hmm. I know you you've been reporting on this stuff for for ages, and you have a a different perspective. On, on TWIP, a couple of episodes ago, we were talking about the idea of, of um, computational photography. You know, I think the, the discussion was around focusing later, like Lytro-type technology and how it's making its way into mobile phones, and you know, so you can click on an area and focus it later. And I heard a rumor, that an, un, an unsubstantiated rumor, obviously, that Lytro might be going in that direction, where you would be able to shoot video and then pick your focus point later in the video. So shoot light field video where then you could then, you know, make your selection and do post-processing instead of just on exposure and color balance but also on focus point and all that. The question to you is, considering all that, that and then you overlay this kind of stuff in there where now you, you, know, you in the future you can select video, change exposure, all this stuff and 
click a button and make everybody look like supermodels. Is this the direction where things are going away from optics and into code? Is that the future of photography? Well, it's it's already moving that direction. There are a lot of uh, lenses out these days, particularly on fixed lens cameras, that are inherently flawed, and they fix the flaws in the software. Mm -hmm. um, this is done to try and make lenses cheaper and easier to manufacture and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but when it comes to this uh, skin smoothing stuff, this isn't actually a new thing for video. It's been around for many, many years now. I oh. have a, a bit of software in my toolkit from uh, uh, Red Giant Software. Um, they call it Magic Bullet Looks. Um, and it's designed to apply a whole bunch of different looks and, and filters and styles to raw video so you can get things that look cross-processed or, you know... It, Everything from the, the cheesy Instagram style filters all the way to much subtler looks like the, the look they used in The Matrix, for instance, where everything's sort of got this green tinge and it just makes color correcting and all that sort of stuff a bit easier. But amongst that toolkit, uh, they have exactly this kind of thing where you can um, soften skin tones and smooth them out and it does pretty much exactly the same thing. I don't use it quite a lot myself because it's very processor intensive, of course, because you're basically, you know, instead of working with one image and softening the skin, you're doing hundreds or thousands, so it takes a while to process. Um, but yeah, it, it's not a new thing by, by any means. It's just, you know, someone else has, has come along and said, oh, we can do this too, and perhaps they're doing it better than Red Giant Software because they've got that heritage of already doing it with, with stills. So. But as far as the, the Lytro stuff goes, I did speak to the, the gentleman who invented the Lytro technology way back when right. the first Lytro camera came out. Uh, he actually came down to Australia when they were just launching onto Australian shelves and uh, had a chat to him about the, the video uh, and stuff like that. And he says, well, yeah, it's absolutely possible. It's a little bit far away at the moment because, again, that too is extremely processor intensive yeah. because you've got to do you know, 30 or 60 frames per second and there's a big chunk of data that has to be processed and stored and you know, computed on the camera device itself and sped onto a memory card that has to be fast enough as well. So there are a lot of challenges that sit in the way of doing that. But I don't think it's going to take over doing things the, the more traditional way in the professional world or semi-professional or even hobbyist world for a long, long time yet because giving up that, that amount of control to fiddle with later is not the way a lot of us, I think, think. It's not the way we're going to teach others to think when, you know, people who are doing this stuff teach it to others. Getting it right in camera, I think, is more important than doing it later because getting it in camera means you save a hell of a lot of time on the back end doing it in post-production. And post-production is a very expensive thing. Time is money. And the most, you know, t the more time you can save getting things looking the way you want them to look in camera instead of making that decision later the better off you're going to be, I think, in the long run. Um, even if you're doing it yourself, you know, as a hobbyist, you know, and, you, and you, your time is valueless, let's say, it's still going to mean you're going to have to sit in front of your computer, do a lot of tweaking, and watch your progress bar tick along for, you know, hours on end processing all this stuff. So I don't think it's going to make a bigger splash as perhaps Lightshare would like it to make. Very interesting yeah. technology, but I don't think it's close to being... Uh, a threat to the way things are done now. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, there's. It's just. It's. It's almost like science fiction, though. When I when I think about it, from like if you if you rewind back to the film days when we had one thirty five millimeter frame to capture everything on, and we had to get it right, especially when you're shooting slide film, and now you're talking about these terabytes of data that machines will sift through to do focus later and retouching on the fly and all this other crazy stuff. It's just, it's full of stars. I don't know. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> it's fun stuff. All right, guys. Uh, before we continue, I want to give a nod to our second sponsor for this episode of This Week in Photo, and that's our good friends over at lynda.com. Okay, I'm going to skip through to listener Q&A. All right, guys, it's time for some listener Q&A. This is the segment where we answer a question that has been at the top of some of our listeners' minds. And this week's question comes to us from Mark Stowe via our Google Plus community page. More Google integration there. He says, most of us who work in the photography industry or listen to TWIP are aware of the lawsuit brought against the photographer who refused to shoot the wedding ceremony of a gay couple. The photographer cited personal convictions for not accommodating the couple. Let's say, in a different scenario, a client asks for a photograph you felt was in very bad taste. 
could you refuse to produce that photograph? Where is the line drawn? Sarah, you knew this was coming at you, right? I did. <laughs> you, I you did knew this you. You're at a wedding. You're at a wedding, and somebody asks you to do something that is clearly outside of the France comfort zone. Do you do it, or do you say pound sand? Oh, that's so tough. So we really try, um, for a lot of reasons, when it comes to our business, uh, to accommodate people in any way that we possibly can. Uh, I can't particularly think of a situation where I've said like. No, we won't do that. But um, I definitely think can think of a few situations where I thought, I don't really want to do that, but mm -hmm. I will. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, if you guys want to do that, sure, go for it. But it's probably not going to make the final cut. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's definitely yeah. not going to make my previews or my highlights, I'll tell you that much. Um, so I think in in this situation, like when it comes to weddings or portraits or things like that, you have to have a delicate balance between um, being the creative director with your clients and having them trust you and telling them when something isn't necessarily a good idea and why. Um, but also just being understanding that some people have really unique um, needs. So, for instance, we had a client this last weekend who, when she filled out the questionnaire, said that she wanted a photograph of her and her father looking back as they were coming down the aisle during the ceremony. And I, I've never seen that done. And I'm thinking all of these guests are going to be looking at them, and then they're going to turn around for a photo thinking that we were like, hey, you two turn around and let us take a picture. Oh, hi, so, camera. I didn't know you were there. Hello. Yeah, exactly. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. They wanted us to look at them, not come down the aisle naturally. So I was yeah. like, oh, I definitely need to have a conversation with her about this. So I called and I talked to her about it. It turns out that her parents have a photo like this, and she wants the same thing. Totally mm. understandable. Yeah. So we talked about it. We picked the best spot where it wouldn't be strange. It was before they actually started coming down the aisle so that they could have the wedding ceremony in the background and still not distract. So I think that in a lot of cases there is really just a conversation that needs to be had that yeah. says, you know, hey, yeah, we can totally do that, um, but it's just for you guys. Like, but let's go for it. Or, hey, I want to understand better what you're looking for and why and figure out how I can best serve you. I, I also have clients who will assume that when we do a family shoot, they should all show up in khakis and white t-shirts. So I have to work really hard to make sure that they understand why I don't feel like that's a good fit or a good style and yeah. what I would prefer that they do and, and really giving them that leading information um, to make sure that that's not a misunderstanding or that they don't just assume that because everybody is in jeans and white shirts for a family for family sessions 10 years ago that that's what they need to do now. So that would be, if that answers the question, I think that um, there, I can't think of a specific case where I'd say, no, I don't feel comfortable doing that. Um, but but on to, just just to set the, the stage there, there are some freaky people in the world. So. I know. <laughs> I there think I used to do some really strange things, Frederick. Yes, where you would just say, you know what, uh, maybe I'm not the photographer you, for you. you maybe you want to <laughs> go, like, Nate, Nate Burr might be the guy for your, <laughs> for your well, wedding. Well, if you find out ahead of time that they want, oh, I've absolutely had clients who've called and asked for really unusual things before they booked me. Oh, don't. Don't even step into that water. I immediately refer them to somebody who would be a better fit for them style-wise. Yeah. But if you're at an event or you're at a shoot, which is what I think he's asking, and they ask you to do something that is unusual, you have to gauge if that's something that's going to be really damaging to you um, and if it's something that would really cause a problem for you personally. In some cases, it's like really personal things. I, I mean... I don't want to get into detailed stories, but I've been asked to do some very strange photographs. And it just depends on where your barriers are and what you're comfortable with. You're definitely okay saying, you know, I, I'm not okay with, 
with that, with shooting that, but typically the way I phrase it is, oh my gosh, no, you know what, you should have Joe shoot it, he has a really great little point and shoot and I think he'd be fantastic and you pull Cousin Joe in and you make a big joke out of it and everything's fine because yeah. there's really, um, when you just say no, there's something about that that's just like, wait, what? I don't understand with no explanation or um, no solution. So I always try to, hey, I'm not the right photographer for you, but let me refer this photographer who I think would be perfect for that kind of style that you're looking for. Or if it's the day of the shoot, you say, you know what, um, I have to go shoot the um, ceremony details. I'm so sorry, but um, I saw Joe over here. He would be fantastic. I'm sure that that he grabbed that shot for you, but you can always come up with something. Trust see, me. See, that's why I probably would not make a good wedding photographer because <laughs> I have absolutely no problem saying no. <laughs> You're like, um, like no. Bluntly, I, you know, NFW, no, I would not, <laughs> no, not going to do it. Nate, what, what about you? I mean, is the customer always right when they come at you with, with weird requests or are you, you okay saying no as well? I, I, I've said no lots of times, but the discussion we're having, there's a line to be drawn between you know, your personal beliefs, your personal style, uh, what you think will and won't you know, stick out as unusual in what you do generally versus what is sort of morally questionable, like saying Correct. no to a gay couple or saying no to a, a, an interracial couple. Yeah, uh, or something like that. You you imagine the situation happening, what thirty, forty years ago with with you know a, a white photographer and and you know a, a coloured um, couple. Um, mm. So th there's there's a line to be drawn between what is acceptable by today's societal standards and our laws regarding uh, this kind of discrimination, next to what you are comfortable doing creatively. Um, or within your within your own framework of your morals. I've said no to the people who've come to me and said, "Oh, we've we've got this product, we're doing this event, and we're going to do this." Or it's, you know, it, it's been one of those things where it's yeah, those forced viral kind of things that trying to be deliberately deceptive or something like that. And I've said, no, "This that's not who I'm about." People watch me because I'm straight down the line, no BS. You know, I'm not going to. Uh, um, mess with people like that. And I've, I've tried that once when uh, Blackberry did a a, a pretend uh, protest outside an Apple store, you know, try, trying to get, to, well, I forget what the exact message was, but, you know, and people reacted rather poorly to to uh, how that all fell out as well. And so mm -hmm. I've, I've avoided stuff like that in the future. I don't regret doing how I did it. It was a very interesting thing to do and see how people react and, and see how people sort of try and filter through it and find out what is what is morally acceptable for someone like me to to do but you know that's that's the mildest example of it I was okay with that because I said to them straight away I'll only do this if I can be absolutely straight with what's going on I'll do the original video then I'll do a follow-up saying this is what happened they came to me and they said they were doing this and I thought it would be a fun interesting uh, you know video to to sort of provoke reactions from people you know not deliberately troll them to get them angry but just to to make them sit back and think or, you know, examine something. But there are other things that I've said no to where, you know, it, it's been just something that is a really bad fit for the way I present or the style of stuff I do or the, you know, the, the type of content I do or the type of products I cover. I've said no lots and lots of times. Yeah, um, yeah. Just on, it's on okay. It's okay. It's okay to say no. I mean, yeah, and you 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 drew the the perfect line because we were we were sort of talking, you know, somewhat flippantly about you know if it's if it's an uncomfortable situation like someone says, you know what, hey, I like pictures of my toes, and you can say no. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't, I don't. I maybe Joe could shoot that, but the, you know, the 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 politically charged piece of it, Blundy, like you brought in was. You know, if it's an interracial couple, you said color, but you can colored, but you can say black. It's okay to say black. <laughs> so if it's, it's a it's black, a if it's a black man and a white woman, or you know, whatever mixed race couple, then the nuances become a little bit more strained, right there, right? Because you know, you're like, well, I don't really want to shoot you because whatever racist reasons that you may have against them, then it's a different story altogether. And I don't think there's a right answer for that. We battled back and forth on that. 
because you as a photographer, no one can force you to create art if you don't want to create art. No one can force you. They can say, okay, you have to shoot that couple because it's morally correct to shoot that couple, or they can even they can even require you by law to take photographs of that couple, but they can't require you to make good art. Right? Yeah. I mean, you, know? you, you, are, you are hiring, you know, from the other side of this, you are hiring a creative professional. You are hiring an artist. You're not hiring a plumber. You can, you know, hire a plumber and say, well, I want the pipe from my bath to go all the way around the room before it goes back to the tap. Yeah. And the plumber may think that is stupid, but if that's what you're paying him to do, that's what he does. Yeah. But if you're paying an artist and say, I want you to shoot this, you know, with a, 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 I can't think of a good example, but, you know, something outside of the usual style or approach or anything else like that. It's, you know, a completely different situation yeah, when subjective. you're hiring a creative professional. Yeah, art is always subjective. Because if, if I say, Sarah, I want you to shoot my wedding, and for whatever reason, Sarah doesn't want to shoot my wedding, and by law, I compel her to shoot my wedding... I could get crappy pictures out of this, you know, or at least not what I expected because she didn't want to shoot my wedding and I forced her to do it. Right, Sarah? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Sarah, will you shoot my wedding? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I kid, I kid, I kid. All right, guys, let's let's move on from this. The last sponsor for this episode, last but not least, is our friends over at Squarespace.com. Okay, folks, let's jump into one of my favorite segments of the show. Uh, this is the pick of the week segment. This is something that you can suggest to the TWIP listeners. It could be whatever you want it to be as long as it is somehow related to photography. Sarah France, I'm going to let you go first. I know you have a hot okay. pick of the week. You actually stole my pick of the week, by the way, because I was going to oh, pick Oh, I did. Well, I'll let you do it. No, it's all yours now. <laughs> Go ahead. Be um, self-aggrandizing, Sarah. Go ahead. <laughs> my pick of the week is a little bit of a self-promotion. I'm super excited for my first time ever being on Creative Live. It's been awesome. a long time coming, so I'm really excited. It's at the end of this month, so it's May 29th through the 31st. I'm doing a class on Apple's Apture, so Apture 101 on Creative Live. It'll be, there was an Apture that, um, I think it was Scott Bourne did it like years ago, mm -hmm. but it's not even on the site anymore. I think it was like he was one of the free. first ones. He was yeah, one of the first like, of black people. Yeah. I want to say it was like the second week out or something. So it's it'll be really um, the newest uh, Aperture 101 on there, and they don't even have that one live uh, available anymore. So I'm really excited to have something out there, and it's going to be a really fun class. I know it's a software class, so it sounds like it's not going to be a lot of fun, but we have a lot of really cool stuff and exciting little elements kind of built into it. Plus, it's just a fun and easy way to learn, and it's three full days with me training from beginning to end with Aperture, even including book design. So nice. we're even um, putting in, building beautiful albums on um, Aperture, and I'm excited. So come join me in Creative Live, and we're, we're actually um, not only looking for people to, of course, join the, the class, but we have some spots, I think, still open in the live seats. So we need to uh, fill some seats in the live studio. So come to Seattle and hang out with me there and watch uh, Aperture 101 and ask me individual questions. I would love to see a great audience out there too. Tell them to record it in the Bay Area. They have Bay Area studios too, and I will. I will <laughs> You're like, I want to come. Just fly to Seattle, Frederick. It'll yeah, be fine. Yeah, because I'm not tired of planes at all. Let I, me tell you. you know, I mean, you have like at least a few weeks to recover. So. You'll so be when fine. is it again? What's the What's the date of the live show? So the date is um, May 29th through the 31st. It's Thursday, Friday, and or yeah, Thursday. No, Friday, Saturday. No, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Okay. Yes. And the cool thing about Creative Live is if they miss it, they can go back and, and purchase and watch the course later, right? Yeah, absolutely. If you can't make Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or if you can only catch a section of it and want to get the rest of the course, you can always purchase it after the fact and um, watch it really at your leisure anytime you want, as many times as you would like as well. All right, well, check it out. See, that's uh, I'm gonna watch it, even though I have Aperture on my machine. I'm pointing to my machine as if people can see it. 
Um, I have Aperture on my machine, but I don't I don't use it. Obviously, I use Lightroom. But I want to know what Sarah thinks about Aperture. It would be, yes. you should get Joseph Lenaski to come on with you and <laughs> you know do his little tap dance. Dynamic duo. The dynamic <laughs> duo. Yes, one two punch. Well, cool. Yeah. Awesome. So Sarah Apple Aperture 101 on Creative Live. We'll link to that in the the show notes for this episode, so people Thanks. can get to that. Awesome. All right, Nate Blunty Burr. What's your what's your pick of the week? I have a little light to show you, and uh, let me refocus the camera here for the video guys, so you can see what okay. I'm talking about because it is little. All right, we're looking for the audio people. We're looking at something that is between his thumb and index finger. It's tiny. It's it's uh, the measurements are 27 millimeter by 32 millimeter, and it's nine mil deep. So it's an inch, inch and a quarter, and uh, 0.35 and an inch thick. And what it is, it was uh, a Kickstarter project. It's called the Eye Blazer. And it's designed for using on smartphones to uh, to be used as a, a triggerable flash, but also a constant uh, light source for video. Um, and it is consisting of four high-powered uh, LEDs. They've got a 70-degree field of view, a little bit of custom optics in it to uh, spread out the light nice and smoothly. Three different power modes, so you get three different brightness levels. Um, so uh, on the lowest level, it will shine for, um, uh, just let me check the notes here, I think about uh, up to three hours. Jeez. Um, 16 lux. That is and really the bright. second power level, which is 60 lux um, at one meter, and that will shine for, I think, uh, 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 up to about 50 minutes. And on the third power mode, uh, 25 minutes worth, but it shines out 120 lux. And uh, I've been using this thing... Uh, since I got the Kickstarter reward, it's actually now on sale proper. Um, and there are three different, oh, two different models. There's a plastic model and an aluminium model. I would suggest getting the aluminium one because the aluminium body serves as a heat sink, which means you can output more power for longer, which is really good if you're using it for video work like I do. Um, and if, you can, if you're seeing the video, you use, it's got the little 3.5 mil jack that goes straight into the headphone socket um, on your smartphone, uh, iPhone or Android. And there's a special app you can use to trigger it, so it can work as a flash, but also as a constant video light. But during the Kickstarter um, project, there were a lot of uh, people who backed it saying, well, I want to use this in my hot shoe as well. So they made this little thing, uh, which is just a little piece of uh, molded plastic, which clicks onto that 3.5 mil mount and gives you a hot shoe uh, mount. So this tiny little light, it can last for, you know, between an hour and, th well, between half an hour and three hours, depending on, the, uh, the the brightness level you've got it set at, and it works brilliantly as an ultra portable uh, uh, video light you can carry with you all the time. And I've used this recently when I was test shooting the GH4. I was doing some low light 4K video, and I made a, a little sort of a, a mini documentary on a light painting photo walker went on. Uh, it's called I Love Light. If you search for I Love Light on YouTube, you should come across it within the first results. Uh, search for I Love Light and my name Blunty, you should find it immediately. But it works remarkably well, and it outputs a really nice, uh, uh, smooth light, um, nice and consistent. It's daylight balanced, 5600K, so it's properly daylight balanced, so you can mix it with your other lights. And it even comes with this little uh, silicon pouch here, which can pop over it to, uh, to diffuse the light even more, so you get a really, really smooth uh, uh, output from it. And it's just... One of the most fantastic things I've gotten recently, um, especially. And how much? Uh, how much is that, Nate? How much does that cost? Uh, they are. Um, hang on a sec. I think between the the plastic model is about uh, fifty or 60, fifty bucks, uh, and the aluminium model I think is about seventy, just under seventy bucks. I'm That's buying it. that. I'm buying yeah. it right now. Yeah, that is so cool. Um, oh, and they even give you a little pouch to carry it in. But yeah, this thing is in my bag all of the time, and I've used it dozens of times on, on video shoots. I've done it uh, with, with some iPhone photography, sort of backlighting, underlighting stuff, and you know, yeah. it's just a fantastic bit of kit, and I love it to bits. Uh, that's, that's a no-brainer. That is uh, a no-brainer. I-B-L-A-Z-R dot com, but yeah. Can you, um, yeah, make sure you, make sure you throw uh, the link in the show notes there so we can, yeah. we can yeah, yeah. share that out, well, so that I can buy it. That's what I really meant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, could you share links so that we can both get it? I'm, really, I'm just thinking about the TWIP listeners. That's all, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Awesome. What's your pick, Frederick? My pick of the week before my internet connection craps out again. Did you guys see that? My internet connection completely died. I did, but I was ready to just pick it up and become the host for the rest of the show. So I thought I was going to have my moment. I thought. Oh, you, uh, you are awesome. Thank you. All right, here's my pick. <laughs> So here's a, one of the cameras I brought to uh, New Zealand with me is this GH3, this Panasonic GH3. Um, but this is, you know, like Nate was talking about in the beginning, the new model is the GH4 that shoots 4K and all that. I don't have that one. I just have the older one, which is well, awesome. Well, still. technically the GH4 Wait. isn't quite the replacement for the GH3. It's another It's model. different, right? Yeah. It's just a, another family member, more specifically designed towards video, whereas the GH3 is, is kind of a balance between video and photo, I guess. So maybe this one's better for me. Maybe, yeah. I don't feel so bad. Now. <laughs> <laughs> I thought so you were anyway, dropping My, my pick to... isn't the camera, though. The pick isn't the camera. The pick is this lens that's on the camera. Nate, I know you know about this. This is the Leica Noctocron 42.5 f1.2 lens. This thing, I mean, it's a, what is it, 85 equivalent, right? So on the, on the crop sensor. But... It's my pick of the week. I just got it literally day before yesterday, just started shooting with it. And I know that Nate did a review of this lens. So, Nate, tell us yep. why this lens is awesome. <laughs> yeah, I, I did a review of this lens for a, a show called DigiDirect TV I do, which is sponsored by a local Australian camera store. So it's not on my main channel if you're looking for it. But, if, again, if you search YouTube, you'll find it. But, yeah, this is the new the new Noctucron lens, so specifically designed to be awesome in low light, and it is. But it's especially good on the Micro Four Thirds uh, video shooting side of things because it has one of the smoothest uh, manual focusing uh, mechanisms of any Micro Four Thirds lens I've ever used. And a lot of the lenses, because they're all fly-by-wire focusing, even in manual focus mode, it's all still electronic. So on the, say, the Olympus 12mm, even when you're doing manual focusing, it tends to step and jump a bit. This thing, though, buttery smooth all the time, which works really well on the Panasonic's because not only is the battery smooth, but the Panasonics have that wonderful focus peaking mode that you can use in video as you're recording. So it makes it super, super easy to use even these really bright lenses in manual focus. So yeah. it's just an astoundingly beautiful piece of glass. And uh, I, I desperately wish I had the pocket money to go out and buy one right now because I would. I'm I'm a fan of this. The only thing I don't like about this, because I have you know the little one too, right? The 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 little 45 millimeter 1.8 Olympus lens, yep. which I think that was my favorite lens because it's it's only like this big. You could throw that in your back pocket and forget about it. But the images out of that thing are insane, right? Yeah, it's it's one of the sharpest lenses out there. Um, it's just insanely sharp. The only thing I don't like about Olympus is 45 is the plastic body, and mine's pretty banged up because I take it with me a lot in my bag, and <laughs> the plastic body tends to get a bit uh, marked up and a bit damaged. The lens still works perfectly, but you know, if you're uh, a bit vain about your the lens's condition, it might bother you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean that that was the uh, that's kind of the the catch 22. Olympus made this insanely cool <laughs> lens. But they made it out of plastic, and it's insanely cool, so people actually use it. You know, mm -hmm. the nice lenses that look great and never get used, and they stay in the bag. So, catch-22. So, anyway, that's my that's my pick. I'll put a link to this in the show notes. It's not a cheap lens, like uh, what he was saying. What is, what's the cost of this lens? Like, uh, I think it's in the $1,200 range. Yeah, 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 it's, it's so. something, yeah, 1200 1300 something floating around there, depending on what currency you buy it in and when you get it from and all that. Yeah, yeah. So, not a cheap lens, but it is, I think... For portrait photographers, or you know, even even landscape people that are trying to get the compression in there, I mean, it, it's a it is just an amazing piece of glass that I will probably keep for the rest of my life. So, <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. Expensive, All right, guys. Worth every dollar, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's my story. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> um, we are at the end of the show. Uh, I want to give a, another thanks to our friends over at FreshBooks.com, Lynda.com, and Squarespace, Squarespace for their generous sponsorship of This Week in Photo and helping us keep the podcast slash show going. Without them, we would not be around. So thank them and please support them with your clicks and your dollars. Also, Sarah France, where can people go to keep up with you online? Um, you can find me on my website, sarahfrance.com. Um, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Google+. Plus. You can really go to any of the social media spots. And, of course, you can find me on Creative Live at the end of this month, May 29th through the 31st. So come <laughs> see me there as well. Right. Cool. Awesome. Sarah, it's always a pleasure having you on. Thanks for coming. Thank you. 
All right, Nate Blunty Burt. Nate, before you tell us where you are online, where does Blunty come from? There's, I feel like there's a big story behind that name. What, what's the secret story? I, yeah, I get asked this a lot, and actually, just before we started this hangout, I got another message about it from from one of the random fans out there. <laughs> nice. It's the the short shorter version of the story is way back when I was in the early twenties, I think you know, twenty one, twenty two at the time. Me and a group of friends, we went and saw a movie in a little, uh, tiny little uh, local theater called uh, uh, Chasing Amy. Uh, and in that movie, uh, directed by Kevin Smith, Kevin Smith is also in it as a character called Silent Bob. Yeah. Uh, and the character called Silent Bob in that movie had a uh, comic book character created after him called Blunt Man. And it all goes back to the fact that Back then in the day, my beard was shaved, shaved exactly the same as uh, Kevin Smith kept his beard. I had the long hair just the same as him. And I grabbed one of my friend's baseball caps and put it on backwards like he has it in the movie. And, you know, the resemblance was, was striking. So from then on, you know, my mates started calling me Blunt Man. That eventually got shortened to Blunty, as is the Australian way with nicknames. They always get shortened. Um, and from then on in, you know, it was just my, my nickname through the group of friends. And then I started using it as my online handle because, you know, why not? Um, oh, I think my camera just cut out. That's okay. Yeah, we can still hear you. you can, <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it started out as a nickname based on a resemblance of a fictional character based off another fictional character based off another guy who directs movies who I happened to look like. And it stuck. Uh, and it's there yeah, forever. It's stuck. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Cool. All right. You heard it here first. Well, maybe not here first, but you heard the story straight from the horse's mouth where Blunty came from. Kevin Smith named Nate Burr. <laughs> so. yeah. Well, it also tends to work well for me based on my general attitude of being, you know, very blunt in, in what I do these days with the reviews and commentary and, and you know, the editorial type stuff as well. So, it, Which uh, is great, uh, by the way. I mean, you're, well. you're, yeah. that's one of the reasons why I subscribe to your channel because you... You have an opinion, you know, and opinions are hard to come by online. You know, generally things are whitewashed or, you know, they try to appeal to the masses. And you are not afraid to piss people off, which is awesome. <laughs> well, I don't think I'd go as far to say as opinions are hard to find online. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, out, well strong opinions. opinions are Everybody hard. has an opinion, but strong, well articulated opinions with facts to back them up are hard yeah, to find. That's, that's a little trickier sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, awesome. Well, hey, Nate, thanks for coming on again. Again, this is your second, officially your second appearance on This Week in Photo, so thanks yeah. for coming on. First as an interviewee and now as a, a co-host, or what did you call me at the meeting? A pundit. A pundit. A pundit, yeah, I'll, yes. I'll have to add that to my business card. <laughs> yes, yeah, put pundit, pundit on there. I use pundit because it means we can, you know, plausible deniability for accuracy <laughs> in what we say. <laughs> So we don't have to be a real news organization because we're pundits. We just, you know, pontificate on things. All right. Uh, and uh, and the, the, but, you can find my punditry on blunty.com. B-L-U-N-T-Y. No, not .com. Sorry. <laughs> .tv. Blunty.tv. B-L-U-N-T-Y.tv. Blunty. Uh, yep, yep. And from there you'll get uh, to my YouTube stuff. You'll get to my Google+. Plus. You'll get to my Twitter. Uh, I don't think my Flickr is directly linked from there, but the, everything I post on Twitter is normally Flickr related, uh, Flickr related anyway, so you can find your way to there from there. Uh, just follow the trail of breadcrumbs. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well, cool, man. Thanks again for coming on. Hopefully you will come on again in the future. It was a pleasure, and I would love to come on again, yeah. Excellent. So, All right. You're on the hook. Chatting about the stuff is what I do, man. Cool. Well, well, you get to do it here too. <laughs> All right, folks, listeners to This Week in Photo, you can also, you know, always check us out at thisweekinphoto.com. There you'll find all of our show notes, random blog posts, and all kinds of goodness over there. And from there, you can connect to TWIP's various social presences. So please check us out over there. And if you'd like to touch base with me directly, you can do so at my personal site at frederickvan.com. And with that, it's time to take that lens cap off. <laughs>